Yeah, happy to be here. My name is Alon Zybert, as you said. For those of you who are wondering, originally from Israel. Um, I don't know if you know, but Alon means an oak tree in Hebrew. I didn't know that. Thank God I came out six foot four, right? Yeah. Um, and uh, I'm, you know, I'm doing uh, business consulting. That's the kind of high level. Yeah. But more on the emotional side, more on the relationship side. So, okay. Yeah. So, so we connected over um, LinkedIn through someone or other, maybe Marcello. Marcello, yeah. yeah. Cocktails with Cello. Cocktails with Cello. Heck yeah, man. dude. He's, uh, he's an interesting cat, man. He's awesome. Yeah, yeah. he's a good dude. He's, he's, he's very much an organizer, a giver, someone who wants to help other people out. Also, you know, he gets a little bit of shine with his platform too. So right. it's a beautiful handshake, which yeah. is great. It's like win, business win, 101. Um, but we connected and there was a lot of resonance uh, between us, a lot of connective tissue walks in life and also perspectives and experiences but also there's differences too and that's what makes i think relationships beautiful so for some context talk a little bit about um your journey because i know yours is not like many others with growing up where you grew up with and some of your uh experiences tell the world a little bit about you man wow um it's a loaded question so mm -hmm. i grew up in israel as i mentioned uh, the north side of Tel Aviv, okay. which is considered to be an affluent place, actually. So, um, you know, I never felt that I missed, like, I, we were fine. Yeah. We weren't rich, we weren't poor, we were, we were fine. Um, and I, uh, probably sixth grade, I started playing basketball yep. in a club. Yep. And, were you uh, tall at that point or no? Yeah, I was yeah. always tall. Yeah. I was always tall. Um, and then I started playing basketball and I was good. Yep. Um, and it kind of ended up being like how good best on your team good close to it yeah yeah so top, starting top yeah <laughs> start, starting <laughs> starting seventh grade I yeah. would play with my age group yeah but then I would also play with a higher age play group. up yeah play up yeah so I would have two practices a day after school an hour and a half each yep right and then I'll take the bus home whatever and it sounds like a but I never, I always tell my kids, you know, I never looked at myself as, man, I'm miserable. I need to take the bus. And yeah. it's, it's dark and it's... It was life. Uh, and you it enjoyed was, it. It was life. And I always, always looked forward to it. But I work, you know, two practices a day, yeah. every day, pretty much. And uh, <laughs> so basketball became my life yep. uh, in a way. So, um, Everything you did mapped over that. Were you watching basketball games? Were you like watching, yeah. you know, was there local stuff or international like NBA stuff? Yeah. Like what were you doing? So uh, back then we had one channel yep. on TV and it was kind of local Israeli channel. We didn't get much of the American, yeah. you know, aura, if you may. And so it was always America, yep. right? America. <laughs> uh, and then my dad used to travel for work a little and he would go to the U.S. and he would come back and he would get me shoes. Yep. Like I, I, my, my first Jordans. You oh, know? very oh, cool. God. Oh. Very cool. And then he used to bring this VHS uh, tape <laughs> yeah, yeah. of all stars. Like the so highlights and stuff, right? Highlights. Yeah. So Larry Bird, Isaiah Thomas, um, obviously Jordan yep. and, and Barkley. So I used to watch it over and over and over and over, like every little thing. And I would take some tips from them. Sure. I I still remember Barkley, he was not super tall, but no. he would be a great rebounder. He's a powerhouse though, yeah. So he would say that he had a little fence by his house that he would jump over. That's how we would get his hops. Yeah. Right? So yeah. I found a fence and I used to <laughs> go back and forth and I actually got some really good hops, yeah. hops at one point. So that was, that was pretty cool. Uh, so basketball became a big, uh, big part of my life. Uh, I don't know if you know, but in Israel, after high school, uh, everybody has to serve in the mandatory military. service. Mandatory service. Uh, men go for three years. Yep. Women go for two. Uh, unfortunately for me, it wasn't anything flashy. My service because I wanted to play basketball. I That's was where playing, your focus was. I was playing at a professional team back then. Yep. Um, and I was at that level that I could somehow, you know, do something with it. Um, you ever play against any? But like. Tony Kukoc, you ever play against any of these uh, Vladi Divots, like any of these like international so, stars? So yes, yeah. um, I was on the court with them. Okay, uh, I can't say <laughs> I, I, I was at that yeah. level. But uh, do you know uh, Drazen Petrovic? Yeah. Okay, so he came to play us. There was a, a Korach Cup, some European okay. tournament, yeah. uh, league. And uh, he came and played, and listen, everybody, including our coaches, tried to guard him at that game. He scored 54 Just points. went off. 
And uh, <laughs> it was, it was. I was a kid. I was 18 at the time, yeah. 19. Yeah. You know, I'm watching this, and uh, you're still not even fully formed as a man yet. Like, like uh, our minds aren't fully formed really until you're 25. But like, even just that man strength. Like, like I felt like I came into my strength around my 30s. So it's interesting you say that because, you know, when you go through it, you're like, especially at 18, yeah. you think that you're. But looking back, my God, I was so naive and so um, inexperienced. Yep. And I, one of the things, again, I keep telling my, uh, I have a 20-year-old yep. daughter who is actually now in the military in Israel. And I tell her, look, spend time thinking. Thinking what you want to do. Yep. Thinking what, because <clears throat> if I had just spent the time thinking, I was just going with the flow. Yeah. Right? And I thought I was good and You're I still thought I was all that. And unfortunately, I didn't have any mentor or, or guide or... None of your coaches really no, stepped up for that? No, yeah. nobody stepped up. It wasn't really like here, super high you know, profession. It, it's, it wasn't really paying yeah. a lot uh, for the coaches. So yes, they were full-time coaches, but they weren't you know, that character that you were looking up to. Right, I can tell you some stories about the coach back then, and uh, that were pretty embarrassing, especially for me as a young kid. Yeah. Now the interesting thing is that I'm playing, but I'm service, service in the service in the military. So you're doing both at the same time. So you you go in in the morning uh, to serve. Yeah. So I was doing like a call it clerical job. Yeah. Or whatever back office. Yeah. Stuff so I can go in the evening, in the afternoon. To practice. It's almost like a job, like a nine to five, right? Being exactly. in the military over there, you get to come home on the weekends and the evenings, yep. depending on what's going on. Exactly, yeah. that's exactly it. Sometimes yep. you stay the weekend, sometimes you do this guarding, you do this training yep. or whatever, but, yep. but basically it's the, the position I was in that wasn't very meaningful, unfortunately, looking back, uh, but it gave me the uh, flexibility I needed to play. Yeah, you had you had a duality going on. You had the service and your your loyalty to your your people and your country, but you also had your goals and dreams and want to play basketball. Well, and, and that's interesting because <coughs> back then that's all I wanted or knew. But you touched an interesting point, right? Goals and dreams. I never really sat down and say, "Here are my goals." Yep. Here are my dreams. Yep. But about a year before I finished the three year service, I started thinking about. I want to go to the U.S. Nice. I want to go to college. Yep. I want to play ball. Yep. Who was college. your favorite player? Like when you got these videotapes, you mentioned Barkley gave you some motivation, but like out of Bird and Jordan, and who, who was yeah. your who was your go-to? You know, it's uh, when I was much younger. Dr. J was actually, mm -hmm. and and again, I didn't know much, so I saw Grace. Yeah. And I saw, you know, fancy. Yep. And I really liked uh, I really liked that. Looked him up. I looked up to him. Uh, I remember when I first ever got into a team. I was sixth grade. Yeah. Right. And they gave me a jersey and they asked me what number you'd like to be, it, or maybe they didn't. I just picked. You know, at that age, who asked you? Right. And I picked number six for Doctor J. Doctor J. Yeah. So uh, I still have those uh, those memories. Was that your number throughout your career? You tried to pick uh, it. Most most yeah. of my career back in Israel. <clears throat> Okay. Uh, yes. Later on, later on, I kind of said to myself, you know, I'd rather be the person or the player that makes the number. Yeah. And not the other way around. Right. Yeah. So you empower the number. Give me my whatever number. I'll make something out of it. Where did you? T where did it go? Your career. So it sounds like did you go to different countries in terms of playing for other uh, other clubs or other teams or no, was it no, always no. Israel? So once I finished the service. Yeah. A month later, I was in a community college in San Diego. Okay. Wow. Yeah. So and you made the trip. So Came I made the trip. So I took the SAT in Israel. Yep. Uh, I don't remember the score. <laughs> Doesn't matter. Yeah. Uh, you passed. You're here. I passed. You're alive. <laughs> so here's the thing. I was cocky. Yeah. Very we all cocky were. And naive. I sent tape to a bunch of colleges. Back yeah. then... No internet. Right. No cell phones. It's like that VHS. You're like, what like is this? It's yeah. a technology that used to exist. <laughs> but, you know, I made a tape and I mailed it yeah. to some colleges. And then some of them wrote me back and, okay, maybe you can come by and try out and whatever. I'm like, what do you mean come by? Uh, what, what was I thinking? Right, right. Isn't I, the tape good enough? <laughs> yeah, <I'm, laughs> like you're thinking, right? right? <laughs> so... Then I, this guy, American player who played in Israel, yep. uh, Kevin Bradshaw. Okay. Kevin, if you're hearing this for whatever reason, <laughs> connect with me. I'd love to say hi. Um, 
unbelievable player. Uh, and um, he knew the women's coach at Grossmont College in San Diego. Okay. Community College. Yeah. I heard San Diego, I heard I have relatives there. Okay. Again, naive. Yep. Super naive. I'm like, all right. So I literally did everything by myself. Like, got the brochure, yep. um, wrote them, I'm coming. And How did that moment feel? Like, I mean, like, like, like you're an 18 or so year old kid and you're living in Israel your whole life and yeah. you think the prospect of going to America, the prospect of playing ball, like, like yeah. what did that feel like during that time? Were you, were you like nervous, excited, like you couldn't wait? Like, like where, were you, where was your headspace? First of all, Jesse, I gotta tell you, that's an amazing question. Um, and I was almost on an autopilot. Just blinders on. But looking yeah. back, I was running away. Yeah. You're running, running from away from two things, yep. I think. One, my dad. Yep. Um, my dad and I had an interesting relationship. Um, and the other thing, I think I was running away from myself. Yeah. Um, so there's a saying I learned over the years called, don't hate me because I'm beautiful. Okay. So, uh, you know, I don't want to sound cocky or anything, but I would notice people's reactions to my physicality when yeah. I enter a room. Your presence, yeah. My it, presence. It, it, like, preceded you. And I thought I liked it, but then over time I didn't like it. Yeah. Because they assume, yeah. you know, whatever it is that we all assume. People, yeah, they make yeah, assumptions. Right? And I said, you know what, I want to go somewhere else where can I recreate myself. Yeah, start over. Start over. Yep. Which, looking back, like, shit, I didn't like myself or the situation I was in, and I couldn't express it in yeah. other way. My parents back then, you know, uh, they always loved me, and I know I can only imagine, but they never really were involved. Sure. Or, you know, so I signed up, and I, and I basically told them I'm uh, planning on going, and they said, okay, you have a relative in San Diego, okay. second cousin. Okay. Uh, with Live with them kind of thing? Or no? Well, yeah, they yeah. will pick you up from the airport. Yeah, you know? and it, it's also very naive thinking because you're thinking, oh, I'm going to America mm -hmm. to people that live in America where you have gold on the streets. Yeah, yeah. And they will <laughs> absolutely, whenever you need, for whatever you need, right. will be there for you, take care of you, <laughs> right? So, I, and I also had ego. You know, I we all do. I worked and saved from basketball a little, and yeah. I worked extra jobs wherever I could to save. And I bought the plane ticket, and I paid for the first semester myself. Yep. And um, even though you didn't have goals, you were still by, by default you were driven. I mean, being an athlete builds this work ethic into you. I think and so. It, and it keeps you so. like going towards a goal, literally. I mean, like but, to, but to play. What was my, what was my goal? I yeah. didn't have a goal. No. That's the thing. And I don't know what would have happened if I had to go. My goal first was to get out yeah. and, and make it there. And yeah. I got to tell you, Jesse, about a year and a half ago or so, maybe a year ago, I happened to be there in San Diego. What did it bring back for you? What came up? A few things. Yeah. One, uh, the place is a dump. Is it really? The college. Really? Okay. A dump. Yeah? <laughs> a dump. <laughs> was it always like that or it turned into that? It, it was, it, I think it got worse. Worse, but... It wasn't a college, so it, there was no dorms. Or right, it's, it's a community, community college. college. Yeah, so, so right. for, I went to a community college too, and I used to joke about this. I was like, the name of it's North Shore Community College, the place where dreams go to die. That's uh, <laughs> I, uh, but then I, I got some uh, letters <laughs> yeah. from friends that I was um, corresponding with during that time. And uh, I gotta tell you, it hit me hard. Hit me hard, because <clears throat> I am literally depicting what I'm going through there. Yep. And I'm like, oh, I was able to, I, I'm not going to get this because it's, it's $30 or I'm doing this because of, I was working on weekends over the, during the day in, in school, yeah. um, you know, eating twice a day sometimes I, because I didn't have money. Were to, you doing the ramen noodle thing? Like what were you eating? Oh, of course. Yeah. Whatever I could. Yeah. Right? 99 cent store didn't was matter. for me the, yeah. the you know, the, <laughs> the Macy's or whatever. <laughs> but... I never looked at myself like I'm a mi like I'm miserable. Yeah. Like I'm suffering through this. Yeah. Um, but it was but it was intense. Sure. Now, again, after that year, after you pass through that and looking back, now you're like, bring it, whatever right. it is. Right. It's it's nothing. Growing pains, new new country, new people. But the thing is, you never stop. I never stopped to say, hold on, what am I doing? Be present with it. Yeah. Right. Um, the thing was, I did have a. 
crisis or um, a pitfall during that year that after th three months there identity uh, or like no uh, four of my best friends in Israel got killed in a car accident no way yeah one no of them way. one of them was supposed to come visit to join Shit. me at the second semester um, how was it any kind of drinking involved or was it just they took a bad turn kind of thing no um, they were driving fast yeah every kid nobody knows to. exactly yeah. Um, what happened that second? But they smashed into a, a truck. Oh no way! Head on. Yeah. Head on. Ugh. All four of them. The thing is, this they videotaped themselves through the throughout the weekend, partying. Yeah. Uh, enjoying life. Enjoying life all the way through the through the accident, actually. Really? Yeah. They in videotaped the car through the accident. Everything. Well, not the accident okay. itself. Okay. Because it, it, it kind of going happen. blank. Yeah. But um, wow. so in Israel, they turned their video into educational. Um, like film. a cautionary tale. Cautionary tale, or wow. here's a story of these people. Were you supposed to be with them? You had some like so, survivor's regret? Uh, yeah. See, now you're digging <clears throat> in, and, and I'm happy to share. So a year before, I went with four, all four of them yep. to the same city in the south of Israel. Same trip. We drove like crazy. Yeah. We drove like crazy. Yeah, I was a kid, too. Um, I get it. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and so, we have videotape from that weekend as well. Yeah. Funny enough, I'm actually the glue that brought them together. So um, two of them were in my class yep. in school. Yep. Uh, one of them I grew up with playing basketball, we were best friends. And the fourth one was in the same military base as okay. my best friend. Yeah, so you were the connective tissue. So I was the connective tissue. Yep. Um, and here's another interesting thing, Jesse. I know we're kind of yeah. going around, but uh, my mom came to visit me three months after I left, yeah. her and her sister. And I was in San Diego. We met in Vegas. Wow. Right? And uh, I'll tell you, it's funny. You, it brings back some interesting memories. You know, I remember my mom going shopping in an outlet or whatever, buying sweatshirt for my brothers. Yeah. And, and I'm thinking to myself, shit, this sweatshirt, these jeans cost $29. Yeah. And I can barely afford right. to eat now, right? <laughs> so uh, that she didn't know that. Yeah. Um, I didn't blame anybody, but it was literally like a twitch. You of, had that perspective of like kind of almost in a way like humble beginnings and then seeing someone where they were doing something nice for their family, but it was like, it was a weird feeling to be. It was just yeah. kind of, you know, like welcome to life, yeah. right, in a yeah. way. And the other thing is, uh, so it was 6 a.m. in Vegas. My dad called us in a room and told us about the accident. And uh, when he told me, it was after the funerals already. Oh, no way. So like a day after. Now again, no internet back yeah. then. So you no. didn't know until it was yeah, done. I didn't know. And one of the things that I still carry with me, and it's an interesting philosophical question, right? And he dealt with it as well from what I know. And uh, for the record, my dad passed 11 years ago. You know, he didn't give me the chance. Mm -hmm. It would have been hard to make it there with a the plane and whatever. But he didn't give me the chance to decide. He decided for me. Yep. And he consulted with a friend and you know, and all that stuff. And it was weird because he went to the funeral and it was, you know, I saw the papers after. It was all over, front pages, everywhere. Because yeah. it's, you know, it's funeral hopping. Four, you know, four funerals and Terrible. and all and I see on the pictures all of my friends. Like yeah. literally all of my friends. Um, so that was uh, that was that was hard. That was uh, that was hard. It's still. What did that period of time look like for you? For however long, just dealing with the grief, emotion. Did you did you just stuff it away? Did you like step yeah. into it? Like, what did that look like? No, I think I stuffed it away. Actually, yeah. I uh, I don't think I dealt with it. I don't think I knew how to deal with it. I didn't have anyone to deal with over there. Yeah. I was by myself. Yeah. Right. My mom stayed for a few more days and left, uh, and I went back to <clears> practicing <throat> and going to school, uh, and work. I yeah. had to survive. Yeah. Which, looking back, could have been the right thing to happen because it kind of forced you yeah. to, to do what you had to do. Um, later on, I started dealing with it. And, uh, and um, it, was, it was interesting. <laughs> it was very interesting, to, to say the least. Um, anyways. Yeah. So you, so you got through it one way or the other. You're still playing ball. Like, well, what's the next 
kind of checkpoint in your life from there? Did you realize at one point, like how, did, how far did basketball take you and then what'd you segue to from yeah. there? Yeah. So one thing I'll tell you is um, things in my mind came easy to me yeah. in life, yeah. in general. When I say easy, the fact that I worked at two jobs in the weekend or whatever, but it was never something for me that was a struggle. Yeah. You know, and I got good grades and I played basketball in an okay level. Yeah. Yeah. I knew I was not going to be any NBA player and it's not going to be my career. Uh, but I also never really, if it was too hard for me, I don't, I, n I never really went for it. I see what you're saying. Yeah. You know, so I'm like, that's good enough. Yeah. Um, but I knew there was no way I'm staying at that junior college, uh, community college. There's how long, no way. Two years? Is that how long one you're, year. You were there one year. I was recruited yep. during that year. So I met this guy, I don't even remember <clears throat> how, and rich guy. Yeah. Local, and they, they had pickup games and whatever, and he asked me to join, and then he took me to one-on-one, -on -one, and he's like, I want you to talk to this. He had a friend who was a coach, and I ended up going the next year to Stony Brook. Okay, yeah. In Long Island. Yeah. Um, and here's something interesting. So I didn't have enough credits. I, I, I was missing like one class or whatever. Yep. And I signed up for this, back then the correspondence classes okay. started. This is not <laughs> online right, like in right. front of a computer yeah. Zoom session, right? Yep. This is send something in and you get it. And it was a math class. And so I went there and they signed me up for the team. And I said, sure, I'm going to do that course from Israel. Yep in the summer, I'm gonna spend the summer in Israel. And I went back to Israel and I managed this basketball camp yep. uh, over the summer. So you still Again. stay plugged into the basketball community? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, it was, I needed some extra cash sure. or whatever and it was great and, and I, never, I never really completed the course. Really, okay. And then I came back and I'm like, yeah, I'll be fine, I'll finish it somehow, whatever. And I never did and, and um, so I ended up redshirting for them, not playing. Yep. Uh, that year. How did they take it? Were they pissed? They were pissed. Yeah. And I didn't realize it back then. Yeah. Because I'm like, I'm whatever. Yeah. Uh, but coach, because he counted on me as a resource for him, and now he doesn't have a resource. Whether it's on the bench or playing, doesn't matter, really. Yeah. Uh, he was frustrated and pissed, and at the time, I didn't get it. I didn't get it. Were you still practicing, though, with the team and traveling so with I the was, team? I was practicing and traveling for a while. Yeah. I think first semester. Yeah. Um, and that was another thing, like, eh, you know. You just started kind of Every morning, 5.30 a.m., by yep. 6 a.m., you're on the track field, and then weights, yep. and then, you know. It's the whole process. The whole process, seven days a week. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and I'm like, eh, maybe it's enough. Yep. Yep. You know, I didn't want to push too hard. Um, and then there was another uh, kind of break, because this was my first winter yep. in the Northeast. Yeah. <laughs> right? I'm bunk bedding yeah. with a Greek guy. <laughs> I can't imagine thinking it. Now remember, I'm older than most students because yeah. I did three years in the military. Yep. Right. So there's this cultural gap, maturity gap. For as sure. Well. For sure. Now I'm at a college where you have five, six, seven, whatever thousand students, undergrad, dorms, and the whole sorority and fraternity. The whole. Were you the beer buyer guy for people? Like, or like for people? <laughs> <laughs> you know what? No, mm. never. But I didn't fully connect. Yeah, yeah. I didn't fully connect. Because you didn't resonate because you already had kind of done some of that or yeah, grown past it. Yeah, cultural differences, call it whatever. Yeah. Um, and then after the first semester, I'm like, you know what, I'm done. Yeah. I'm, I'm lonely. Yeah. Stony Brook has a train station from the Long Island Railroad, okay. LIR, that goes to Manhattan. Okay. Every Thursday evening, you'd see people with bags of laundry going to the train station yep. and taking the train home for the weekend. Like a mass exodus, like leaving the school exactly. to go to the, yeah. And then I would take my laundry to the laundromat yeah. down the hall yeah. and I would usually stay by myself. Yeah. I had a girlfriend at the time, which helped. Sure. Uh, but I was by myself, yep. it, which didn't help yep. the whole. So mid-year, I'm like, I'm done. Yep. Um, that's it, I'm going back. and. I went to work at my dad's friend in New York. Okay. Uh, the winter break. Yep. And I ended up going to play to shoot hoops at the Y. Yep. Met this guy, Jewish guy. He's like, hey, there's a school in Manhattan called Yeshiva University. Okay. Private school, one of the top 
50 business schools in the nation. Wow, okay. Yeah. Sai Sim School of Business. Never heard of it before. Uh, I'm like, yeshiva, that sounds too religious for me, right? I'm not a religious What does that guy. mean for people listening? Yeshiva, in Hebrew, it means uh, kind of sitting together. Okay, like a community, uh, like a tribe. But it's, when you study the Bible, the, yep. the Torah, the yep. you know, Bible in the Jewish world is the Old Testament, yep. right? Uh, when you study, you're sitting together. Okay. Okay, and so it comes from that. And, um, and so it's a double curriculum school. Right. In the morning, you study the uh, Bible studies. Yep. In the evening, afternoon, you go to business. Business. Yeah. And it's Division Three basketball. Okay. Which compared to Stony Brook, what was Stony, Stony Brook? Stony Brook was at the time Division uh, Three going to two. Okay. Now they're one. So okay. They were on the way. So to they were way moving up. Okay. But here's the difference. At Stony Brook, you wake up in the morning, you go to practice, you know, whatever. Yeah. Yeshiva University, the gym opens at four. In the afternoon. Yeah. <laughs> Right? And we had two to three practices a week. Yeah. Because people, a lot of religious people were on the team. Yeah. Friday, they go home, they come back Sunday night. So yep. you don't have practice Friday, Saturday, Much Sunday. Much different process Completely from seven different. days a week to like eh, a few times. Completely different. <laughs> uh, but it was a challenge for me. Yeah. And I said, you know what? I'm going to take it. So you actually liked this version of the challenge. Like you're, you kind of, something drew you towards it. You know what I liked? I like to be, I like the fact that I'm good, good education, but I also like the fact that I could be different. Yeah. Pretty easily. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, and you kind of were looking for some of that too, like as you were growing up and like coming over to America, looking for that change. And, yeah. And uh, I ended up enrolling there and um, first year was a struggle okay. because the system completely different. Yeah. And I'm like, you know, just an adjustment clashes. Yep. And I, Thank God I had a coach, uh, Johnny Halpert, who was a psychologist in his profession. And he taught me, it took him a whole year, but he taught me, uh, let the game come to you. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Second year, and also I had three uh, seniors at that time that didn't like me. Right. You know, it's right. The, their year to shine, Some and all of a sudden maybe. this guy yeah. comes, and I was pretty good. Yeah. And, uh, they didn't want their sunshine stolen, so yeah. to speak. Yeah. Second year uh, was amazing year. Was it? Amazing year. One okay. of the best years of my life as far as basketball, as far as just overall. What was your thing? Scoring, rebounding, like what defense? No, no, I was, uh, I was between scoring and um, dishing. Yeah, you know, yeah. I'm a very, very much team player. Yeah. I love the two plus two Facilitate, equals five. score. Yeah. 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 Um, we had a great year for school. We made it to the ECAC tournament, which was like the fourth time in the school's history. ESPN came and did a piece on That's us. That's fun. Nice. Uh, we played at the Garden. Okay. Um, and, and really, yeah. that's incredible. Yeah, that's, that's that the was mecca. that was the mecca. <laughs> yeah. And so that that was really really good. I mean, the <clears> New York, uh, one of the magazines. It was it was just. It was just great year. Everything yep. connected, and I was just blossoming. It's just a beautiful year for you. Yeah, and then uh, I injured my ankle like second or third time already. Okay. And so by the third year, which was a pretty good year, uh, I, you know, I'm not playing physically. Is this exactly. considered your junior year essentially there, or is this like how, yeah, yeah, yeah? Okay. So I ended okay. up doing three years. There. Okay. So okay. total five years. Yep. And did three years. Okay. Um, so played three years for them. Yep. Um, School was good, yep. you know, finished with a bachelor business. Now, during that time, D3 doesn't offer athletic scholarships. Wow. Yeah, so, so they working? offered yeah. some financial aid, yeah. but I need money. Yeah. I'm renting an apartment. Every I'm, kid does. Yeah. Yeah. Not and, every kid. And somehow, say. year yep. two in, in yeshiva, I ended up working for an Israeli company being a tour guide. Okay. Which looking back changed my life because I learned that I love right yep. standing in front of people yeah impacting them I learned that I have amazingly sensitive antennas that see dynamics yep. in the crowd and the yep. people reactions and I can address subtleties and mm -hmm. different things. I also learned that people actually listen to me when I talk. So basically you found your calling, man. So you, you were able to see 
something that you were really good at, that you were called to, you felt like you were helping people, and you even had some amazing uh, follow-up years later from someone that you talked to? You know, you, you, when you and I met and started talking, you saw what I do today, and I, you know, my thing is emotional relevance. Yep. Right? I coined emotional relevance, and I spent the last two years researching and doing a lot of, and one of the things, the basis of emotional relevance is that when we go through an emotional experience, yep. we remember it. Yeah. That's science, yep. right? It's engraved in our memory. Um, I was leading a group, being a tour guide, into DC. Yep. And we came from a l few days up in Niagara Falls, going down through Pennsylvania, the Amish country. We ended up at like 7.30 p.m. in our hotel in DC, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and the hotel was walking distance from the mall, from the mall in DC, not the shopping mall. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, I told my uh, the team it was two buses, two, you know, fully loaded buses. So we we were about a hundred people. Okay. And I told them, look, guys, everybody's tired, whatever. I'm gonna see everybody at 11 after dinner, whatever. At, it was like 11 p.m., okay. 10:30 p.m. Yeah. at the lobby. Anybody who wants to come, I'm gonna walk to the mall, to the Lincoln Memorial. Yeah. Just do a little bit of history, a little bit of take advantage of your surroundings while you're there. They have a they had a tour schedule for the next day, but yeah. if anybody wants to see it at night, it was beautiful night. That's awesome. Anybody wants to join me? Are there people? I've never been, especially that time of night. I've never been. Period. So are there people still out there at that time of night, like still touristing? And that's or the is thing. It, First yeah. of all. Only two people did not come to the lobby. Okay. So you're talking about almost a hundred people. That's all of them crazy. came. Crazy, yeah. Because people want something to do. They want a, a feeling, that that experience. And so I took them to the Lincoln Memorial, and I have a vivid memory, vivid memory, of me standing. My right foot is on the on the staircase. Yep. Right on yep. the staircase. The hundred people are sitting all on the stairs, right? Huge staircase. Yeah. In Lincoln Memorial. For sure. Behind me is the reflection pool, you know, the obelisk, the Washington Memorial, yep. you know, the um, Capitol Hill, you know, and they're watching it. And I'm watching Lincoln, like Abe, yeah. you know, the, the big statue. <laughs> and I'm about to tell him a story about, uh, you know, the, um, the Civil War yeah. and... And I stopped. Okay. I couldn't. It's. I like. I took a picture in my mind of that moment because everybody turned quiet. Yeah. To, to your question, no, there are not a lot of people there yeah. at night over yeah. there. Just your group was the big group. That's it. it. Yeah. Maybe a couple of. Yeah. You know. Is it still lit up though? Like it's still you can see everything. It's still light, yeah. and yeah. it's. I was so emotional at that moment. And then I went into my, my spiel. On the way back, it was midnight, and I stopped at a uh, payphone. Payphone. This is 1997. Was it, was it uh, a dime or a quarter at that time? Uh, well, they he, made a he, transition. Hear me out. Yeah, depending um, on where you were calling. I'm doing a collect call to my dad. So, a few dollars. <laughs> I, I don't know how much you paid. For him, yeah, more than a few dollars. <laughs> but he's waking up. Yeah. What time is the difference? What's the difference? Seven there? hours. Okay. So it's seven a.m. there. Yeah. I'm calling my parents. Yeah. And my dad picks up to share this memory. Yeah. And I'm like that. You know, I just, I have a hundred people around me now. I'm fucking. They're they're looking at me. Yeah. yeah. Who the fuck am I yeah. that they're looking at me? It still didn't resonate back then, Jesse. The power that you have when you're talking to people and people actually listen. So. Uh, that was one of my biggest uh, thing. Anyways, fast forward, you know, moved to Israel. Yep. Uh, after that crazy, you know, story, I, I'll tell you offline. Yeah. Uh, we got screwed, but decided to go back to Israel. Got married. Um, went to work for a software company. Yep. Moved to Boston. Yep. Did four winters in Boston. Oh yeah. So I'm grinding yep. software life whatever. Uh, I'm not doing what I really love to do. And I, I, but my always burning passion in yep. there to, yep. to do, you know, something in front of people, to be in the limelight, to be on stage. Because yep. uh, the feeling it was giving you and the people that you were affecting and you would be affected by that. I mean, it was just, you found what yeah. you wanted to do. 
That's exactly it. So four years in, in Boston, started my master's yep. in Babson. Okay, yeah, Babson. Right. Um, might as well, I'm there, do my master's. Then the visa-wise, work-wise, it was either going for a green card okay. or not. Yeah. And so back then we were like, you know what, let's just go back to Israel. Okay. Because we wanted our kid to start school there and we were, you know, we thought, if, we, if, if I finish my master's and we get the green card, we're not going back. Yep. So it's like, let's go back. So I never finished my master's. Okay. We moved back to Israel. I worked for the same company for two more years. And then, you know, I don't know if you know, but Israel's, Israel has a, has a nickname in recent years. Okay. A startup nation. Really? I yeah. didn't know this. Yeah. So Israel per capita, the number of startups is the second in the world after Silicon, Silicon Valley. Valley. Man. Okay. If you look at the New York Exchange today, the number of public Israeli companies, I think today's number three after U.S. and China, China maybe. Probably. Yeah. But think about it for a second. Yeah. Germany, France, Italy, Japan. Even just the size of Israel being yeah. so small where everyone has to serve their country because it's just a yeah. small country, mm-hmm. right? So there's a book called Startup Nation. Okay. Uh, and it became like, you know, a nickname for Israel. So the culture yep. is... is uh, you know, all right, let's come up with something. Yeah. A lot of investors and the, so the Business whole minded, true ecosystem yeah. for startups is, and today is just absolutely booming. Uh, every vertical you can think of. Yep. I mean, I don't need to start talking about all the technologies that today, in everyday use in your phone, there's Israeli technology. Waze it. is an Israeli company. Is it? Uh, Wix is an Israeli yeah. company. Oh, yeah. Website uh, building, yeah. Right. Yeah. So, uh, but you have a lot of things you don't even know about that are there, medical <laughs> field, etc. So anyways, in the nature of all this, a neighbor of mine came to me and said, hey, I have an idea. And this is how I started Truval, okay. which is my second startup, supposedly. And that's how I got into the travel industry, right? So I worked at uh, this company and I brought it up and raised funds and hired people. This is grind. Yeah, you know, started it's scaling it up. And it's, uh, it's pretty amazing experience. And then after three years, we started getting some traction in the U.S. Who is the person to go to the U.S.? It's me. Yep. So I'm like, all right, as the CEO of the company, small company, but as CEO, we're moving. Back then I had three kids already. All right, we're moving where? Uh, we vetoed the Northeast because of the weather. <laughs> uh, but we needed to stay in the East Coast because yep. of the time difference. My development team was still in it Israel. It just made sense. that Yeah. So it was either Florida or Atlanta. We heard good things about Atlanta. And uh, it was you know, cost of living, weather, the airport. Yep. Back then they had a direct flight to Israel. Uh, Delta, please, if you don't mind, Love Delta. Bringing, back, bringing back the flight, yeah, yeah. direct flight to Israel because <laughs> it's no longer. Um, so we moved here to Atlanta. Yep. And as a matter of fact, my first office was you know, across the street. Right down the street. And I got to tell you, Jesse, I came here by myself at first to you know, yeah. scope the area. Yep. And in like five days, I rented an office space, got an off, got a, a, opened a company, got the license for yep. the company. Moving quick. Found a, you know, and it was all, so if you look back at what I did my first year out of Israel in San Diego, it definitely taught me that do. Yeah, yeah. Do. Yeah. So we moved here. Uh, two years later, the company collapsed. Another interesting story. Uh, we were forced because of the visa to move back to Israel. So uh, for a while, I, I tried to save the company. Yeah. So no salary. Uh, I put all the savings and everything into this company. Um, dealt with lawyers and customers and, and lawsuits and all by myself. Yeah. Basically, I was left by myself, and I tried to save the company for nine months, actually, and then just forced to go back. Yeah. So now we're going back with three kids, twelve hundred dollars in the bank. That's it. Basically nothing. Yeah. Nothing. Thank God we had a great family. We had a place to stay. Uh, but at this point, my wife is like, "Listen, I want it. Israel is very, very um, high cost of living." Sure. Yeah. So I've with, heard that. With three kids to start from scratch, you're like, I'm going nowhere. My wife is like, I want to go back in a year. Do whatever you need. So yeah. I'm literally commuting between Tel Aviv and San Francisco, Tel Aviv and Austin for almost a year. That's crazy. 
yeah. two and a half weeks here in the states, a week in Israel, yeah. back and forth. Yeah, because I got this, you know, opportunity to do this, and it doesn't matter. Stay in the network, of yeah. the travel, technology, world. Um, after about ten months, I get pulled over in immigration in Philly. <laughs> <laughs> One morning. The city of brotherly love slows yeah. down. <laughs> oh, my God. So I get pulled over, and they're like, yeah, you can't go back and forth if you don't have a work visa because I'm a tourist. And I'm like, listen, I'm a consultant. I'm doing consulting for yeah. from Israel. I'm doing consulting here. They're like, yeah, no. Wow. They so shut the, it down. They put me on a plane back to Israel 18 hours later. So I was treated like a, never mind, for 18 hours. Going back to Israel. And this is when I was, you know, then... A couple months later, I uh, got a call from a company who knew me here, and we started working on, I started working on a new visa, and uh, made it back uh, seven and a half years ago. Wow, okay. With nine suitcases, a $15,000 loan to a hotel not too far from here, Damn. as a matter of fact. Talk about emotional relevance. Yeah. Whether I was brave, stupid, naive, gutsy, all of it together, it doesn't matter. Yep. Uh, but that's what we did with three kids, Nine suitcases, a fifty thousand dollar loan. Looking back, what the fuck was I thinking? Right. But uh, again, you're going through it. Here's the biggest thing. A- again, I still don't have a goal. Yep. Yep. Jesse, I didn't have a plan. <laughs> you're just doing. Yeah. Um, and I'm. I don't want to show any weakness to anyone. Yeah. That's a big thing that I've learned over the years, Jesse. You know, today I'm I'm happy to talk about my weaknesses. Yeah. I'm dealing with them, and it, it's okay not to be perfect. That's how, and that's how you get emotional relevance with other people. Well, like that's connective tissue with other that, people. That's the struggle. That's right on. Yep. Right. Uh, I push my customers to be vulnerable. Yeah, you have to be. To Today's day and age is much different than it was even 15, 20 years ago. Yes. And like people that show their scars and show their wounds, like it resonates with people. Yeah. And in business, they buy into you. We have the corporate dance, right? Corporate. Uh, guidelines yeah. that we're supposed to abide by and <clears throat> it's all bullshit but still you know I worked for large company and companies and you know HR had me on speed dial uh, for little stupid things yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it's like you have to God forbid you share feelings emotions yeah. with somebody but here's the thing as human beings we need to feel hugged for we sure. need to for sure. Right? The fact that the U.S. is one of the most touch-phobic societies in the world, yep. that's a b- different discussion. For but sure. We need, as people, to feel hugged, to feel connected, to feel related. Seven-second hugs release, release oxytocin. And well, l- they make you feel better. Yeah. So you're down to seven. Some research say 20. But the point Either is, way, it's, the con- it's the scientific. Contact. Yeah. And if you have, think about emotional hug, a virtual hug. Right, and you, when you can apply it in business, yep. Right, or create a safe space where people can feel that they can be more authentic and genuine and loving. Well, that's that's exactly it, because it leads to trust. Yeah. So I work primarily with, um, you know, executives and sales teams and customer success teams that are offering complicated, sophisticated solutions or or products or service, not selling bottles, because you don't need their, you don't require the relationship right. to be that deep, but the, and the other end, following what you just said, is what we're, essentially what we're offering is trust. Yep, 100%. And trust is based on emotions and relevancy. So if, what I teach a lot of my customers is how to create that emotional experience, yeah. so they remember it. Yep. But then trigger it again and take him through that trigger, that experience again and again and again. So the relationship is so close and it's so pure yep. and it's so clean that you miss nothing. They never want to leave you. And even if you screw up, even something bad happens, they just There's share it with you. You there. fix it. Yeah, absolutely. Instead of, oh, shit, we're going to look for somebody else. Well, you know how it is. It's like, especially during these times, I've been talking to other business owners and business people of how they've pivoted 
and they've self-sacrificed, whether it's with their employees, their clients. And I was talking to one of my buddies the other day, he's, he's a client of my wealth management business, and he was talking about how their company um, like continued to offer their consulting, he's in the health and wellness space, to their current clients so that they wouldn't go without that because they needed it. And they were doing it basically pro bono. They weren't charging them. Like, yeah. we're gonna continue to give you what we've been giving you, we're not gonna charge you, we're gonna stick through this with you until yeah. everything starts to come back online. Think about the brand loyalty and even just like just being a good human being and yeah. like what that does for people. Right. And so it's like if you show people, it's, it's just like going in the military. We were both in the military. You know, we call it battle buddies. But if you had somebody next to you that was willing to go to war with you and, and die with you and go through these experiences with you, those bonds are unbreakable. Yeah. Yeah. And, and again, it's whatever emotional look, and it doesn't have to be as deep or as substantial as a military for sure. war. For sure. Right. It could be subtle little things that and everybody, if you do it on an ongoing basis, yep. you know, before I came in here, a customer called me and, and said, listen, here's a scenario. I'm about to send an email to this person. Help me get some emotional relevance elements into that email. I love it. And it could be little things. Give that real quick if you can, without giving away the farm. Like, what are a couple little pointers that people can do? Like, like you know, there's the how to win friends and influence people. There's all these different things that are out there. But what, what's one or two things people can go to fail safe all the time that's going to make that emotional relevance happen in an email versus like a cold, sterile, bullshit email? Like, what's uh, I'll, yeah. you know what? Instead of going through all the details, etc. Yeah, I will say this. Here's a little exercise yeah, that yeah. I do with some of my uh, customers before you communicate whether it's email, whether it's phone, yep. whatever it is. Think for a moment, take a scenario in mind. Literally close your eyes and think that you are, you know, it's evening, you go into a bar, you finished a long day, you're sitting at the bar and you're drinking, what is your favorite drink? Let's call it Crown and Coke. Corona yeah. and Coke. Crown and Coke, yeah. Crown and Coke. Yeah, yeah. Cold? Crown, crown roll, yeah, yeah with is ice. It cold? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, can you picture the the glass it comes in. Yeah, for a second. yeah, yeah. It gets a little like sweaty. Think that on the you're outside. holding it and yeah. you feel how cold it is. Yeah. And you take the first sip and you know, oh, ah, yeah. this is. I needed that. Sweet relief. <laughs> right. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, all of a sudden, very subtly, somebody next to you just turns around and flips that Crown and Coke mm -hmm. from your hand and drops it on the floor by mistake. Yeah. And and you're looking and like. <laughs> You're smiling. Yeah. You're not even getting pissed or whatever. You know it was by mistake. The guy wasn't rowdy. Yeah. It wasn't just, just an accident. Just an accident, whatever. And he looks at you. You look at him. Almost like you and I, the first time we looked at each other, right? And uh, you look at him. He looks at you and he goes, Sir, yeah. get my new friend here, a new crown. Next one's on me. Yeah. And then you turn around and you say, I appreciate it, man. Don't worry about it. What, what's your story? Yeah. What are you doing here? Yeah. And then he asks you, What's your name? Jesse. Great. What do you do? At that moment, that vibe, how are you telling this person what you do? How yep. you tell this person about yourself? Yep. This is how you should approach that specific email, that specific, you know. Yeah, of course, if you have, if you just started the conversation or you just started a relationship, it's a little, but get that in your mind. Yep. Be you, yep. be authentic. You don't have to cuss, you don't have to go crazy, but be you. Yep. Okay, the other day, so I have a blog I, I write for the last two years. It's called Two Weeks Notice, a touch of emotional relevance every couple of weeks. I tell stories from experience. Yeah. So my last post was after I attended this online seminar. And the woman that started the seminar, the first 10 minutes or so of the seminar, was an executive lady from this large company. Jesse, she was fucking reading off of a script. Now here's the, the psychology and science behind it. When we were listening online and we don't see her, yep. our senses are much more acute because we don't see. Right, you have to listen so more. So it's yep. even more yep. distinct when yep. she reads, what the hell is wrong with you, woman? Right, there's no emotion in there, yep. it's all robotic, it's yep. all, look, it, okay, be you. So, and by the way, if you can't, because you're not good at speaking in public or in front of you or whatever, get somebody to do it for you. Yeah. It's okay. Yep. Right? If not, work on it. But be you. So, that, that is my, one of my, my you know, biggest thing when I take people, customers, companies, whatever, through 
through that, of course, there's some more different yeah, elements. Yeah, uh, for sure. If you want to summarize the, the three elements of that I teach, coach around emotional relevance is stand out. Yep. Uh, make an impact. Yep. And be personal. Yeah. And if you take all three, and I have examples in different scenarios, etc. <coughs> take all three. It's the, the emotional piece of it. The be genuine. Yep. Um, you know, be personal. Um, make sure they remember you. It's all eventually in order to be remembered. Like I said, emotional relevance. Be remembered. Trigger that again and again and again throughout your relationship. Yep. Emotional rel- relevance has been, I think, something that's always been needed, but I feel like the last, pretty much for me since Simon Sinek came online. Simon Sinek, his big thing, he's, he's got one of the biggest TED Talks of all time, uh, and it, it's, his big one is Start With Why. And since then, he's done a, a bunch of amazing work. But Start With Why goes to the mindset of, it's not how you do something, it's not what you do, it's why you do it. Yeah. And it brings it down to that human level, that uh, feeling level, the emotional level. Because there's companies out there that will do something very well. They'll show you how they do it, but there's no like connective emotional tissue on why they do what they do. But then there's companies that are amazing at why they do what they do, and they, they, they transcend the economy. And it's 100% their why, right? Beautiful video. If anyone hasn't seen it, it's called Start With Why, Simon Sinek. But it ties back into emotional relevance, I think, because... People won't care about, it's like that old adage, people don't care about how much you know until they know how much you care, right? And if you are someone who leads with authenticity and people know what they're going to get every time, they're going to get a real human being that they can resonate with. Right. They know someone who is compassionate, they know someone who's empathetic, they know someone who might be funny, they know someone who might be you know, able to you know, do whatever it is they need to do. At the end of the day, it comes down to that personal side. And that's the, for me in my business and the things that I've done, it's always been relationship. It's always been authenticity. I was in banking for years in a, in a, in a culture that's completely political mm-hmm. and completely sterile and boring. And I came in there and I was me, myself, and it completely like set me on this career path that like I've gotten more and more free because of that authenticity and being emotional with people. So I couldn't agree anymore. You know, it's interesting because people do that. Yeah. What I do is just break it down and reverse engineer it to show people who, who can formulate it yeah. how to do it. People have you been doing it. You give them a process it. on how you to have do it. So, yeah. so there is emotional intelligence yep. that have become you know, huge For sure. in the last few years. I took a EQ. niche of it and again I'm just reflecting on it and spotlighting it. Yep. Simon Sinek, um, absolutely, you're absolutely right. You know, and uh, I, I've watched a lot of his things. Yep. Um, but again, it's not that I'm come up with something new. I yeah. just called that specific element, and I'm reverse engineering it to show you how you can repeat it and formulate it into your relationship. Some yep. people it comes natural to them. Yeah. Uh, I just uh, listened to this podcast uh, by uh, a guy Raz who hosts a podcast on um, Spotify okay. called "How I Built This." And, yeah, I know how I built and this. And he. Um, the one I listened to recently was uh, Tristan Walker. Okay. From Walker Company. Okay. Shavings, you know oh, yeah. what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah. Amazing story. Yeah. I highly recommend it. Um, and it's amazing because he started his journey by he wanted to be wealthy, right? And then over the years, he kind of changed it. And he's so authentic right now with his why. Yep. Right? Um, so I'm a big believer. You can see a lot of people that have been doing it. Right, I uh, I just uh, kind of embed it into the business world more for sure, and uh, people who maybe don't know exactly what they're doing or why they're doing. So you just lay out a roadmap and a, and a duplicatable process for people to be able to tap into it a lot easier and say, "This is what you do. This is how you do it," and then they can start adding it to their game, and then it becomes authentic. Yeah, it's funny because I, you know, I recently left a a, a corporate company. And uh, it literally freed me to be even more authentic because yeah. I've been doing it for a while, yep. but still in the guidelines of corporate world and that specific company, you know. And now it feels so much more authentic, like you say, yep. and pure. Um, look, I'm an emotional guy. I don't mind saying it. Uh, my dad, as I told you, uh, passed 11 years ago, and it got me to think a lot more 
about uh, all of this yep. and what so you, you hear and you read all over the place people you know many many people before me after me talking about how important it is to be yourself and to follow your dreams and be authentic uh, it's true it's absolutely <laughs> and only true. when you experience it then you realize uh, why it's important um, you know and I think maybe to f I think we're about to finish it up yeah you know on the very basic human super basic level you and I met online yeah and then we reached out to each other after and we didn't have any problem saying dude I like you man yeah let's be friends yeah in a way right it still sounds weird to a lot of people it still sounds because we have been taught as a society that uh-uh uh, you know two adult males yeah you know can't share emotions it's wrong it's so wrong um, yeah. and I always tell my kids crying is like laughing isn't it yep it's an emotion expression of emotions it's okay to cry go ahead and they saw me crying numerous times um, so that's that's me man yeah man listen I know you get in the interest of time you gotta fly go take care of some personal fun stuff on the on the family side and uh, you know there's there's definitely around two and three of this coming um, maybe a different iteration we'll see um, but definitely have you back on the podcast again brother so right, he's the amazing mighty powerful online Zybert I'm Jesse T catch us on next week's episode of the Jesse T show <laughs>